welcome to worship today with the Ives Chapel United Methodist Church. It is a joy to have you joining us. I'm Pastor Linda Hopwood, and I bring you a word of grace and peace from the God who offers us grace and forgiveness unconditionally. My prayer is that during our time together, God will refresh and renew your spirit and give you a sense of how much God loves you. Before we begin our time of worship, I've got a couple of announcements to share. We continue to offer meals on a weekly basis to people who request them. This is a program that takes people to cook the meals and even more people to help deliver them. If you'd be willing to help with this outreach effort, please contact Sherry, May, or Joan. We're also helping to support Baldwin families by offering milk vouchers. We're doing this through our Feed the Kids program, and the offers, the vouchers are offered through the Baldwin Community Food Pantry. If you feel called to support this cause, please write kids on your contributions and send them to Post Office Box 157. This is a need that people appreciate. We gave out 22 vouchers this most recent Saturday. I invite you to continue to pray for our country as part of a call for 100 days of prayer. Great Plains Bishop Reuben Sines Jr. encourages us to pray daily through Easter Sunday for the healing of our nation. You can find the prayer that the bishop suggests we use on our church website. This brings us to our prayer time. Our Five Rivers District Church of the Week is Lawrence First United Methodist Church where Kay Scarborough is the senior pastor and Jenny Anderson is the West Campus lead pastor. This has been a very difficult week for a lot of people as we faced dangerously cold temperatures, frozen water pipes, and the need for rolling power outages. As of Saturday, the number of people in Texas without running drinkable water was considerably higher than the number of homes and businesses without power as the state continued to struggle to recover from the storm that paralyzed it with a blanket of snow, ice, and frigid temperatures. Millions are under boil water notices in Texas, so please keep that state in your prayers. Please also continue to pray for the friends and family of Judy Wagner, who died on February 9th. We celebrated her memorial service Saturday at Ives Chapel. The service is available through the Facebook page for the Lamb Roberts Price Funeral Home. If you go to that page and like it, that will allow you to view live streamed services. Please continue to pray for everyone who is getting the vaccine for COVID-19 and for those who are giving the vaccine, as well as for the frontline workers who care for us. Please continue to keep Dora Ann's daughter and Linda's sister, Janet, in your prayers. She is struggling to recover from COVID. She has been in ICU at LMH undergoing treatment for her lungs for more than three weeks. Please pray for God's healing for Janet. Also, pray for Dora Ann, who is anxious about Janet's health. And continue to pray for Tony as he heals from a broken bone in his leg. Please pray for Sandy and her husband as they struggle to heal from the side effects of the COVID virus. Please continue to pray for those in our community with existing health concerns and their caregivers. Pray for our families, young people, and educators. 
This is a challenging time for students and teachers. Would you please join me as we go to God in prayer? Oh God, in this season of Lent, give us the courage to take up our own crosses and follow the way you have shown us. Give us the faith to keep going with you until the end. Give us ears to lean in and truly listen so we may understand what you were telling us in those final hours on the cross. Give us hearts to make your words part of our own faith experiences so that our lives may serve to be good news for others. Remind us again that since we have spoken the names of people and situations that concern us, we can release them to your healing touch. Lord, help us to place our trust wholly in you, now and forever. Amen. As they begin to better understand who Jesus is, his disciples ask him to teach them how to pray. I invite you to join me in the prayer Jesus is still teaching us as we seek to be his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from the book of Psalms and our New Testament reading is from the Gospel of Luke. Today I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Psalm 25 is a prayer of David for guidance and deliverance. Hear these words from Psalm 25, verses 1 through 5. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. Today, we are looking at the first of seven statements Jesus makes from the cross. Hear these words from Luke chapter 23 verses 32 through 34. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scripture. Have you ever run in a marathon? I certainly haven't, but a clergy colleague I know has run in several marathons. He didn't just walk around a block a few times and then try to run his first marathon. He spent months preparing, running many miles each day until he was able to run easily the 26 miles that make up a marathon. He still runs daily, so he's prepared for the next race. We too are in a time of preparation. 
it's Lent. And Lent represents a season when we prepare our hearts and minds for the celebration of Easter. You might say it's a time for us to exercise our spiritual muscles. Some people choose to give up things for Lent as a form of self-denial. Others may add in new spiritual practices as a way to grow in their faith. Typically, Lent offers us a time of self-examination and reflection that leads to repentance. Well, wait a minute. Haven't we already been doing a lot of these things? As we've socially distanced and adapted to on-screen worship, many of us have had months for reflection and self-examination. The past year has been hard for all of us. We've had to adjust to the fallout from a worldwide pandemic. The pandemic has triggered economic uncertainty. The economic uncertainty and pandemic struggles have contributed to social tensions and those have highlighted numerous examples of systemic racism. And on top of all those issues, we've had a series of difficult political scenarios to deal with including the January 6th attack on the Capitol that left five people dead and many more injured. Phew, after all of that, do we really need Lent? Maybe there's more to Lent than focusing on the suffering we've already endured. Maybe there is more we can learn from the reflection and analysis we've already been doing. Maybe we also can learn what it is to listen. That's what we're going to be doing for the next six weeks. We're going to be listening to the seven statements Jesus made from the cross. Jesus' final words from the cross can bring us a mixture of comfort and inspiration as they also challenge us in our cross-carrying efforts. Our Sunday messages and Lenten Bible study will be based on a book called Seven Words, Listening to Christ from the Cross, written by Susan Robb, the Senior Associate Pastor at Highland Park United Methodist Church in Dallas. It might be tempting for us to skip the challenging and painful ideas that come from the cross. Can't we just move directly from the happy crowds waving palms to the glory of Jesus' resurrection? As my marathon running clergy friend says, preparation is key. And if you skip the preparation, you aren't going to be ready. The end result of Lent for Jesus followers is recognizing and repenting of our shortcomings and opening our hearts to things Jesus wants to teach us. In other words, we need to prepare ourselves to really be able to fully understand the cost that comes with the joy of Easter. Listening to the final statements Jesus shares from the cross is a way we can learn more about what it is for us to follow Jesus. In his last words, 
Jesus shares some of the most powerful and meaningful things we will ever hear if we're open to listening to them. For many people, speaking comes more easily than listening. Listening requires us to be intentional. We have to commit to the effort that's involved as we open our hearts to all that God has in store for us. I hope you'll commit to taking this Lenten journey as we follow Jesus through the way of the cross. Jesus offers seven statements from the cross that are scattered throughout the four Gospels. Only one of the final sayings is found in more than one Gospel, and six of the seven statements are found only in Luke or John. And John is the only Gospel whose author was an eyewitness to the crucifixion. It might seem odd to us that we find differences in the way the four gospel writers recorded Jesus' last words. It's not as though the gospel writers are presenting us with contradictory information. Instead, what we get are different perspectives that are directed to the different audiences each writer is addressing. As we see when we compare Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they don't all include the same information or details. We see variances in the Gospels with other stories and parables, not just in the accounts of Jesus' death. As we look across the four Gospels at the seven last statements that are recorded, we can gain a clearer picture of who Jesus is and what he calls us to do as his followers. Even though we don't know for certain the exact order of his statements, Scholars have established a traditional order that we will follow in our study. We start with the statement found in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. For those of us who have observed Holy Week, in years past, we know what has gone on before Jesus was nailed to the cross. He entered Jerusalem triumphantly, riding on a donkey, fulfilling the words of the prophet Zechariah. He already has announced that he is the long-awaited Messiah, and devoted Jews see him as the hoped-for king who will lead them to victory over the Roman forces occupying Israel. During the season of Advent, we talked about the fact that Jesus is a king, just not the kind of king that the crowds are expecting. He is not the military leader who will guide them in overthrowing Rome. In the week after his arrival in Jerusalem, things take a dramatic turn, and before the sun comes up on Friday morning, Jesus is betrayed by one of his followers. He's arrested by temple police, mocked and beaten. His disciples scatter, and even Peter publicly denies that he knows Jesus three times. 
The chief priests fear that the Romans will see Jesus as a dangerous threat. So they declare him guilty of blasphemy and take him before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. They charge Jesus with political subversion, inciting tax evasion, and calling himself a king. All of these charges challenge the authority of Rome. Neither Pilate nor the puppet king Herod considered Jesus to be guilty of any offenses that would merit crucifixion. But they yield to the mood of the crowd and sentence him to die on a cross. Luke spares us the gory details of Jesus' execution, but he does tell us that Jesus is crucified between two criminals. Luke gives us more information about what Jesus says from the cross than he does about all the other details of the crucifixion. Luke is inviting us to lean in and listen to the amazing statement Jesus makes about forgiveness. From the cross, an instrument of agonizing torture and death, after he has been humiliated, beaten, and mocked, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke doesn't tell us exactly who it is that Jesus is praying for. The soldiers who beat him, the religious leaders, the crowd who condemned him, Pontius Pilate, Judas. What about Peter, who denied knowing him? His prayer encompasses all of these people but it also includes us. We may not want to acknowledge it, but we too share the guilt. When we allow crowd mentality to guide us to go against things we believe as followers of Jesus, we are guilty of crucifying him little by little when we put our needs ahead of the needs of others. Or we also cause Jesus pain when we fail to consider how the words we say can cause injury to those around us who hear what we say. So what is it that Jesus wants us to hear in his prayer, asking God to forgive us. Jesus does not wait until after the triumph of his resurrection to think about forgiveness, Susan Robb writes. He asks the Father to forgive his killers, even as he is being killed. This offer of unimaginable and inconceivable grace is beyond our ability to understand that Jesus can intercede for those who have caused him unspeakable pain is more than we can fathom. He tells the Father that those who are torturing and killing him don't know what they're doing. They don't fully understand the scope of their actions. By offering this intercession, Jesus leaves open a door for repentance. Through his offer on behalf of those who are crucifying him, 
as well as on our behalf, Jesus is saying that none of us should ever be defined by the worst things that we have done. This is the grace that he offers us. If we can begin to grasp this concept of grace, then we can understand the healing power that Jesus offers us. We carry a debt that is so large, we can never hope to repay it. And suddenly, we find out that debt has been completely canceled. Our sins are forgiven, and we are set free from the burdens of shame, guilt, and judgment. That truly is amazing grace. In 1738, John Wesley, a devout priest of the Church of England, attended a prayer service on Aldersgate Street in London. He had been struggling with the idea of what it was to be forgiven by God and loved by God unconditionally. During that prayer service, someone was reading from Martin Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. Suddenly, Wesley experienced his heart being strangely warmed. Here's what he wrote in his journal to describe his experience. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Wesley realized that his salvation and forgiveness were not earned. They were not based on anything he had done to deserve them. God's love for him was about what God already had done for him through Jesus Christ. Jesus offers us these same life-changing words. Father, forgive them. All we have to do is accept the mercy, love, and grace that are offered to us unconditionally. In the core of your being, may you know the grace and power of forgiveness that Christ offers. Amen. In all that we say and do, we proclaim Jesus Christ. When you share financial gifts with Ives Chapel, you enable us to reach out to children and families in our community. If you feel God prompting you to share with us financially, Please mail your contributions to Post Office Box 157. Thank you for your continued and faithful financial support of Ives Chapel. Now hear this blessing. Go in peace and joy, sharing the good news of Jesus for giving grace and transforming love for all. Amen. Amen.